Kate, we were talking yesterday about uh, conflict reporting and the way it's changed over the years. Your career spans probably four decades now. How, how has it changed now uh, it, it, it compared to when you started? I suppose the biggest change is that it has got harder to get near things. Uh, by that I mean, I think when I started, there was a gentle innocence about the arrival of a television crew, particularly working in countries where there was no TV service. And you had people say, oh, television. And there were even instances where the president was flattered that you were going to get an interview with him and oh, television. Now it's completely changed. A global awareness of what the media is, of the power to both enhance in public relations terms and also to cover up in terms of public relations. And getting to the truth, getting to candid remarks by people who really wield power and are in authority is much tougher. Uh, as for getting towards those events, which people remember particularly by the great impact of television, of wars, revolutions, assassinations, all of those big events which can be caught sometimes on, te uh, on the TV camera. Um, again, there's more knowledge by the people in the street that the camera may not be friendly or it may not be on your side at least. So life has got more fraught. We were rather privileged, I think, 30, 40 years ago. That's changed. When, when Everybody knows about the telly. When you and I were running around former Yugoslavia, for example, 20 and 25 years ago, we could just get in our cars and pretty much go anywhere. The danger was that you might get caught in, caught in crossfire, but there was no danger of being kidnapped or deliberately, for the most part, deliberately murdered, although there were some uh, journalists who were murdered back then. But now that, that danger is very real and very present. The media has moved into a position where it's part of power play, bargaining, part of uh, the whole scenario of who is going to um, uh, succeed. Uh, if you get your image on television, all leaders are looking to do that. All hopeful leaders in waiting are, hoping, uh, are waiting to do that. And we are merely the people carrying the cameras, but with a vehicle that might give them more. On the other hand, we're also the intruding camera who might show up what they're up to, which is either inhumane or uh, criminal or, at least, or maybe even disgusting. And so people will try and keep you out. And there's also the fact that you have um, people, as in the Middle East right now, uh, who know just how to use the camera as much as, uh, and the distribution of pictures on the internet, as those of us who work in the professional media. There's a knowingness now. And because it's part of the power play, the media can no longer move so unrestrictedly. They're seen um, by many as either an enemy or a pawn or something to be used. So it makes life more complicated, to say the least. When we started, the television correspondents worked towards the 6 o'clock and the 10 o'clock news. You had a whole day, that was your aim. The newspaper colleagues that we worked alongside worked to that evening's deadline as well. Now there's 24-hour news. That came in very quickly, changed things very quickly, and even the newspapers now have their websites. So it's a 24-hour it's a operation for all of us. How did the advent of real-time news, and particularly mobile cameras that could get there and transmit live from almost anywhere, how has that changed? Not only the way the public consume news, but the way those of us who provide it have to work. I think it's actually changed both. Um, it's uh, in some countries, not all. Uh, there's very obviously a kind of um, glancing at the moving wallpaper uh, attitude, rather than sitting down and watching television, as people used to say in Britain, with a cup of tea and a biscuit, mm -hmm. to watch 28 minutes at nine o'clock. There's now a sense that you can come in from anything or you can be uh, and look on your, um, uh, your pad or your, your laptop and your mobile or your phone uh, and you can say, is there anything happening? And this, I think, gives rise to um, uh, a different kind of viewing pattern, which means that people just glance to see if there's anything that engages them, rather than sitting and saying, I need to watch 
the news without knowing the content. It's as if you're standing in front of um, uh, one of those rows of uh, Japanese food coming along in a restaurant and you go, I won't have that, won't have that, oh there's one that I like, dum. Rather than sitting uh, at the dining room table and saying, what's going to be on my plate? So there is that sort of pickiness that's come in now. And it does mean that uh, some people can really engage with stories they want to follow, but it also means that I think we probably lost part of a general audience that learnt about places which they didn't really have the initiative to know about or desire to know about. It's become a choice of what really interests me rather than what might be significant. On the reporter side, uh, the pressure is horrendous because, yes, we were often in competition. Oh, gotta beat it, ITN. You know, desperate to get there before the rival network. Now it's a matter of almost beating yourself to it when you have got editorial desks telling you from the centre of the hub, oh, we've, we've seen so-and-so. Uh, even though you're on site and you think you know what's going on, you've seen certain things, more information has come in from people on a phone the other side of the street. You are really up against it. And there is a breathlessness which has inevitably got into the whole system, whereby s stories are now labelled breaking, breaking news, to say that there's something um, cantering along, which may even break into a gallop at some point as we follow it. And the um, <coughs> part of it, I think, that isn't particularly authentic is the idea that news cameras are present or will be present at all big events and will follow them comprehensively. Not so. There will be just as much as one camera can see. There will be just as, to, to verify things, there will be just as one reporter can see. There will be lots of other information flooding in from people saying, I think I saw, but we don't know if that's true. In some instances, this kind of citizen journalism can all add to it, but particularly if you're in a situation where there is a conflict, there will be two sides both telling their story. Uh, you only have to watch, I, to give an example, which I think is going to continue for some time. On most people's television, which they don't bother, way down the dial are various news channels. Russian television, Russia Today. If you watch the dispatches from the reporters speaking English from Ukraine, you then watch BBC, Sky, ITN, any of the Western journalists, France television, German. They are two different worlds on the same day at the same incident, which is quite a lesson. So the idea that we're following everything authentically and giving the full picture is not actually true. The, there's a lot of talk about how social media uh, will have an impact on the conventional business of television journalism. Uh, a lot of people say, uh, because people get their news through Twitter and Facebook and so on, uh, that the conventional news bulletin is redundant, that it will simply die. Uh, but it seems to me that there is, it, it, there is it, there's a greater need than ever for a conventional built bulletin, a considered roundup uh, of, the, of the day's events by a, a professional group of mediators, the, the editors sitting in London or Glasgow or wherever they are. Because social media, the social media, while it can be very liberating and very democratizing, putting power in hands that have never had power before, uh, and the ability for every everybody just to tell their story in an un unmediated way, and I think that's a very positive thing. At the same time, social media can, can become a kind of echo chamber in which you expose yourself only to the views you want to hear, you expose yourself only to views you uh, agree with, or and so you live in a, a media world which reflects your own view of the world back to you. And it seems to me that in that context, a conventional news service is all the more uh, desirable, all the more necessary be, to provide a kind of public space, if you like, I where people, that, people have to be exposed to views that are different from their own. So it seems to be needed to, to preserve the idea of plurality, the idea that there, are, there is more than one way I think to, to it see the I world. think uh, you're absolutely right. And it actually, it's something unfashionable to say. I think that that sort of bulletin, which contains many different views and a, bal and, and a thoughtful and an aggregated um, sort of uh, amount of the day's actual happenings, whether people find it 
intriguing or exciting, and probably not, but significant, yes, from a news point of view editorially. I think that sort of bulletin is needed. What it shouldn't have in is all the comment which appears to have crept in over the last few years, which I don't think is helpful, because let me take you back in this country to the miners' strike. Vocal people on all sides, very, very sharply differing, conflicting views with much bitterness and accusation, which would, if we were on 24 hour news now, um, have a stream of information, all of it probably conflicting minute by minute, with people phoning in, people tweeting, people sending their own video, mm. and an immensely complex and probably hard to um, recognize one single story in it, uh, sort of narrative, w would appear. That's when you need your professional journalist to say, what do we know really happened? What do we think is significant? And yes, people can say that's the arrogance of journalism, but that, I'm afraid that's it. There is a professional idea of how you choose what is significant, what is verifiable, and you put that into a bulletin. I think the more difficult life becomes, uh, social media um, becomes more and more uh, a, a, a mob of voices, uh, which it's hard for any single person sitting, you know, just sit, dipping in every so often to work out what's going on. I think we do need that traditional bulletin. There are those who decry it. There are the people who always say, oh, well, you know, this is elitism. Well, I'm afraid I always equate that with, well, no, you try and get the best people to do the best. And that's what I think ought to be there. And I think you are right that there ought to be a very determined attempt to sum up the day's news. And that should have a prominent place in mainstream media. I think there's still a public appetite for it. I think people still, still seek a mediated uh, uh, version of the day's events from a professional group of people. I think that's a generational thing. Maybe. Come on. I think that's one of the things I find is talking to younger people who have really no concept yet of what that might be, because they don't watch the main bulletins. We've seen the, the newspapers either. Yes, and we've seen both newspapers and the main bulletins have crashed in their audiences. Mm. Something neither newspapers nor TV talks much about this. Why would turkeys vote for Christmas? Mm. So uh, we need to recognize that younger people need to be brought back to or perhaps encouraged to watch a digest I'm talking about of the day's news. I think that's what you're saying. And I think it is important because otherwise you end up, I, I use my analogy with food time and again. There was a time when you ate what was put in front of you and you were told there was nothing else and that the rest of the world was short of food so eat it up. And it's good for you and it included meat and two veg mm. inevitably if you were lucky. Um, nowadays, with the choice of uh, food being yummy, what do I like? What do we have? Mm. An unhealthy nation. Mm. Well, I think the same is there with information. Mm. If you only follow the stuff you like, which gives you a sense of, oh, didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that funny? You know, the quirky bits, the bits on YouTube, um, the, the shock, uh, the breaking news. If you only take a diet of that, you have an unhealthy view of what's going on in the world. This is your first visit to Beyond Borders. What do you make of it? Could I come back to you? <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely enchanting. I have memories of Peebles when I was a child. I was one of those North East England children brought to the hydro uh, where we ran wild for a week or two weeks so it's in the gardens, just like this. Yeah. Um, it brings it back, a sense of freedom really, but in, in very safe but fascinating surroundings. And it's just wonderful. And of course, the history of the place, um, a living history, not a dead museum like one. What this about the, the, the dialogue that you can Oh, I'm so hungry for it. I mean, I was saying um, earlier that uh, it's the sort of thing which, it's like joining a rather wonderful party regularly, but not one where you just gossip about um, people you see and about who's doing what. You're talking about serious matters, interesting matters. There are knowledgeable people that full of stuff that you don't know. And you listen and you think, that's what I want, really. And I love that. Um, I feel we don't have enough in 
these islands at all. Literary festivals are filling the gap. I think they're like great noisy town meetings of interested and involved individuals from all different walks of life. And the more we can have of that, the better. And to hold them in places like this, well, this is just the cream on the top. Okay, thank you very much.